Wow, 40,000 subscribers. It's just mental. I don't know what to say. I'm speechless, absolutely gobsmacked. What a number, what a milestone. It means so much to me that so many of you out there who have enjoyed my content on bikes and bike reviews have hit that subscribe button down below. It means a huge amount and has helped me make this an actual career. So I've been writing about bikes for the last 15 years for websites and magazines, but now doing it all here on YouTube. And I can't do it without you, so thank you so, so much. Okay, on with today's video. This video is sponsored by Pedalshore, the insurance company that makes it quick, easy and affordable to cover you and your pride and joy. And you can cover your bike against theft and also accidental damage. As we all know, accidents can happen from time to time, so you better be covered rather than sorry. You can cover any sort of bike, road bike, gravel bike or mountain bike, and it doesn't matter if you have one bike or five bikes in your bike shed. And right now, Pedalshaw is offering you the opportunity to get a free hip lock DX D lock, yes, free, if you insure a bike worth over 1,500 pounds and pay for it annually. Sounds a brilliant offer, doesn't it? What are you waiting for? There's a link in the description down below. Go and check it out. Okay, on with the video. So the other day, Ribble launched a brand new aero road bike called the Ultra, and it's definitely an ultra fast looking speed machine. And it got me thinking, how do we now reach peak aero? By which I mean, have aero road bikes got as far as they can get without a rule change or some radical left field thinking? Because if you put all the aero road bikes now available alongside each other, lay them out on a table in front of you, they all by and large look very similar. Some people say they look the same. You have to look very closely to see a detailed change between them, but they all have very common features. Drop rear stays, deep cam tail aero profiles, one piece carbon handlebars and stem with no visible cables. So let's have a look at the bike in a bit more detail. And firstly, it's a very striking bike, isn't it? And my eye is firstly drawn to the handlebar. What on earth is going on here? Firstly, like most aero one piece carbon handlebars and stems, all the cables and hoses are inside, so no visible cables outside. But there's no bar tape, and the levers are bolted directly to the handlebars. They're not clamped in place like they normally are on a bike and then wrapped in bar tape. So that's very unusual, very radical, it has to be said. Now apparently this unusual shape, the way it bulges up in the top section, it's all about managing air over the arms and the body of the rider using a wake generator. So a device that pushes air over the rider's arms and body better than a conventional handlebar. It's also really narrow as well, and I'm talking like properly narrow. Now normal handlebar that I use is 42 centimeters from the hood measured in the center, these are 33 up to 38. So 33, that's tiny, I mean, that's minuscule. But interestingly, other brands have been going down the route as well, and Canyon spring to mind as the air road has narrower than conventional handlebars, not as radical as Ribble here, but the idea of a narrow handlebar basically pushes your, your arms in and your shoulders in. So it's all about trying to keep yourself narrow, but also low as well, try and keep yourself as small and compact as possible so if you look at yourself in the mirror when you're on a trainer, try and make that shape as small as possible. So like you don't want your elbows out and your head up high, keep all nice and low and narrow. And that's the idea of narrow handlebar. But I don't know how comfy a 33 centimeter handlebar will be, but that's all in the name, the pursuit of aero gains. So moving on from the handlebar to the rest of the frame, and it incorporates many common aero features we expect to see on an aero road bike. But there are definitely more bulges and curves than we expect on a normal aero bike as we move from the frame to the fork and down to rear stays. But it's a down tube that really stands out on this bike. So we've got a flat section at the bottom bracket like we have on a time trial bike. Then it's really wide around the water bottle section. And then above the water bottle, up near the fork crown, it really pinches in really narrow and then kind of flares into the deep but narrow head tube and then tries to kind of flow into the fork crown as well. So a very sculptured down tube, much more dramatically shaped than a conventional aero road bike. The fork is also very distinctive, very deep blade, and also spaced further apart from the front wheel. But it didn't go to the absolute limit allowed by UCI. They found going in a bit closer produced better aero in a wider range of your angles. That's a wind coming from like straight ahead at zero degree, 
or a slight yaw angle, so crosswind, where you get at lower speeds. The faster you go, the more the wind coming straight at you, the slower you go, the more you get it from the side. One neat detail on the non-drive side of the fork blade is that the disc brake caliper is integrated into the fork blade, try and minimize the drag from that part of the bike. This bike, I'm afraid, is only available with disc brakes. There is no rim brake option at all. And then moving to the back of the bike, we have dropped rear stays, which are a fairly conventional feature on most modern road bikes, not just aero bikes, but lightweight bikes as well. And they're placed in line with the fork blades. That's the same idea we've seen on the Hope track bike. So the fork blades are in line with the rear stays. And on some bikes, the top is in line as well, like we saw in the Filia Filante, it's a good example. It's all about managing the airflow as it goes down the side of the frame and inside the fork blade and wheel and pass down tube and through the rear stays as well. As I mentioned already, it's only available with disc brakes. There is no rim brake option, but there is space for a 32 millimeter wide tire. And there's even a threaded bottom bracket. All it needs now are some mudguard mounts for a year round versatile aero speed machine. Imagine that, 32 mil tires, super fast aero frame, threaded bottom bracket and mudguards. Hello, yes, all over that. So frame weight from this full carbon frame and fork, available in two versions, goes from 1200 grams for a cheaper version to just over 1000 grams for the more expensive version. Prices start for a full built bike from just over 3000 pounds and go up to just over 7000 pounds. And their prices, it has to be said, are really, really attractive. You're getting a cutting edge frame has clearly been a big investment for this small to mid-sized company and prices are quite a bit lower than the likes of Specialized, Trek and Candale will charge you as well. And more than that, you can customize the specification on their bike builder on the website and even opt for a custom paint finish as well. Sadly, the only downside to all that good news is that the bikes aren't available until October at the earliest, but plenty of time to start saving. So that's a new Ribble Ultra Aero road bike. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it down below. And the bike, when I was looking at it the other day, got me thinking, have we hit peak aero? Yes, it's a radical looking bike with a funky handlebar and a down tube that's much more sculptured than most aero bikes. But most aero bikes are looking the same. And that is a function of the rules and just the physics of aerodynamics. The same way that all F1 cars look the same. But when you look more closely, there are details that really stand them out. So not identical, they're very similar because you know, air flows over objects in a certain way and a certain way to reduce the drag and manage the airflow over a car or a bike. So have we hit peak aero? It wasn't all that long ago that we didn't have aero road bikes. For the last 100 years or so, bike manufacturers have been trying to make bikes as light as possible and as stiff as possible. And the first true aero road bike arrived in 2002 with the Cervelo Soloist, which is arguably the bike that really brought aero to a road platform for the first time. Before then, like I said, bikes were trying to be lightweight and stiff, and aero was reserved for time trial bikes. We will remember, we might not be there, but we remember the impact of 1989 with Greg LeMond adopting time trial bars and aero helmet, and how it really changed the game for aero. But that was in the time trial racing against the clock that Cervelo Soloist brought aero understandings to a road bike. And since then, since 2002 up to today, 2021, we've seen the whole aero road bike category absolutely explode. And now road racers, professional road racers and amateur road racers are obsessed with aero, probably more than weight and stiffness that like they were 20 years ago. And now every bike manufacturer has at least one, if not two aero road bikes in their stable to choose from. There's no denying the speed benefits of an aero road bike. I know some people don't believe it, but ride an aero bike and they're so much faster than a normal bike, you really can feel it at a range of speeds as well. And I've been testing aero bikes for the last 10, 12 years since they first started arriving in about 2011, had the original Specialized Venge, the original Scott Foil, had a Cervelo S3, S5, Ridley Noah, many more I can't even remember. And they've always been super fast and they've only got faster and faster as the years have gone by. The speed benefits of an aero bike can't be ignored. I know many people get hung up on the marketing messages which are misleading for the most part because they always quote really high speeds of 45, 50k an hour because these bikes are designed primarily for the pros 
to give them that boost in the peloton where their speeds are that high. And it's easy to think that I don't ride that speed, I don't need an aero bike. But you get an aero benefit from about 15 miles per hour above. So clothing, the bikes can make a difference even at the lower speed. And the key thing is, if you're riding slower, you're still benefiting from aero. But if you're out on a road or a course for a longer time, that's way faster, you're gonna benefit for longer because of the aero bike and aero clothing. So there are savings and wins to be had for all levels of riders, whether you're a pro racing at the top level or you're an amateur sporty rider and you wanna get around that course faster than you did on your old bike. So the speed is definitely there, just you get a bigger return at higher speeds because it's easier to sort of differentiate between the different aero bikes at higher speeds and the savings or differences get smaller, and more marginal at lower speeds. But all that said, Aero road bikes aren't without the downsides and there have been quite a few downsides and compromises that have made aero bikes harder to live with and hard to love over the last 10 years. And these are some of the downsides of aero bikes. Now the first one in my experience has always been comfort. Aero bikes are fast, yes, but stiff, oh yes. Not very comfy on anything but a silky smooth road surface. And here in the Cotswolds where I live, the roads are shockingly poor really badly surfaced, potholes everywhere, gravel everywhere. So comfort has always been a factor, stiff, hard, hard to live with, but thankfully they had got better and better. And the latest generation aero road bikes are surprisingly smooth, like the latest Canyon Air Road, that Merida Reacto, the old Special Avenge, which now is Tarmac SR7. These are all bikes that are decently smooth on rough roads and bikes you can live with on a daily basis if it's the only bike you have you want to race it on a Sunday, but also ride to work on a Monday and do an evening chain gang on Tuesday, bikes that are easier to live with. And the other benefit to comfort on these new aero bikes is the move to disc brakes, which I know many people aren't on board with, gives space of wide tyres, and wide tyres unleash more comfort on any bike, especially an aero bike where it's needed most. And then there's the weight. Their deep profiles mean more material, and even on carbon, the weight is higher than a normal road bike. And a weight penalty on an aero bike has been quite dramatic over the last few years, especially in the early days. Great on a flatter surface, not so good in the mountains, but now the weight is getting much closer to a traditional lightweight climbing bike. Not quite there yet, but getting much closer. And I think there's more understanding around the benefits of aero, even on a shallow climb, up to five, six, seven percent, depending on your speed going at. That aero can still benefit you even on a climb apart from like the really steep gradients where gravity is the biggest factor you have to overcome. So weight, comfort are two compromises to aero bikes, but they have got better. Probably to a point now where they're not compromising like they used to be, you can live with them quite happily. The move that many brands are now taking like Specialized is emerging an aero road bike and a lightweight bike like the Venge and the old Tarmac into one bike with both lightweight and aero with a Tarmac SR7. Not as light as a pure lightweight bike, not as aero as a pure aero bike, but the best of both worlds. And I see many bike brands going in that direction. So that is why I think we've reached peak aero. Because by and large, the bikes are all about the same sort of speed. And that ribble, as radical as it looks, doesn't look much different from other aero bikes. And it probably isn't much faster. I love to see some, you know, a big group test, a wind tunnel test of all these bikes, see how much difference there is between the fastest and the slowest, but I'm willing to bet it's all within the sort of narrow band of each other. They're all about the same sort of ballpark speed. Weight isn't going much lower unless there's some radical shift in carbon fiber manufacturing or a new material like a graphene sort of breakthrough material to make the weight even lower. Frames have stabilized at between 700 and 1000 grams. There aren't really any frames that are much lighter than that. And now we're trying to infuse air into that. The weight has gone back up. So now we need to bring the weight back down again. And we've got the integration, we've got the one piece handlebar and stems. We've now got decent comfort for the most part with this new Ribble taking a 32 mil wide tire with disc brakes, just need some mud guard mounts. That's all the bike you need. But the only suggestion or hint that we haven't yet reached peak aero would be that Hope track bike, which is the most radical road bike, time trial bike I've ever seen. Looks unlike anything else I've ever seen. And unless bikes adopt that sort of design, we see that influencing road bikes, or there's some other sort of loophole, not a loophole within the UCI rules that hadn't yet been exploited, because it's not been seen yet, 
or use our relaxer rules, I can't see how aero bikes are going to get any better, faster, lighter, more comfortable. So that's why I think we've reached peak aero. Not necessarily a bad thing, just saying where I think we are with the aero development that has gone on for the last 10 years to 20 years. So um, that's enough rambling for now. I just want to share my thoughts on aero development and peak aero. Now I'm not saying I'm not an aero expert. I've learned quite a bit about aero during the time I've been testing bikes. I'm just giving my sort of experience view on the development of aero bikes, which fascinates me. I love the development of bikes, road bikes, mountain bikes, and seeing where they go. And I'm sure I'll be wrong. And next year, two years later, there'll be a radical new uh, departure from what we have at the moment. I can't wait to see it. But I do think for now, aero road bikes have plateaued a bit, even though this ribble is quite funky in its design. So I do think we are at a stationary period in the aero road bike development, but I can't wait to see where they go. I've got a few ideas where I'd love to see them go. Lighter, better comfort for sure. But let me know what you think of this topic down below. Do you agree? Do you disagree? I'd love to hear your thoughts as always. But that's all for now. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And I'll see you all again very soon.